Hello. Um, welcome back. So uh, we will have the uh, first talk of this afternoon uh, by Professor Shivaji Shundi, uh, who will tell us about uh, two variations on operator spreading. So th th this is working, right? You can hear me at the back. <clears throat> so um, it it's really great to be here. Um, it's an absolutely marvelous institution in many ways, and I had never seen it before. And so it's, it's been a real, real pleasure being here. Um, it's also very nice to be uh, made an honorary member of the string theory community for one afternoon, uh, to be invited to speak in this meeting, which I take as a sign that um, the organizers were running out of ideas. Um, and of course, it's very nice to be able to see Juan Valdecena without having to drive across town, um, which, as we all know, burns carbon and is bad for the environment. Um, so I'll tell you about some things which will be related to issues that have in come up in the, uh, in, in the string theory high energy discussion. Um, OK, so uh, as you can see, um, my capacity to make slides has regressed. I now write them out in pieces of paper and scan them in because scanners are, are now really efficient. Um, so I'm going to talk about two variations on, on operator spreading. Uh, I'd like to thank, to begin with, uh, Kurt von Kaiserlink, who was a, a fellow at PCTS. He's now in, uh, on the faculty at Birmingham. Uh, Vedika Kemani, who was, uh, 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 is currently a Harvard Junior Fellow, although Actually, she's guaranteed a faculty position next year. It's just not clear which one yet. Uh, Tibor Rakowski, who's a student at Munich, and Frank Pollmann, who's uh, at TU Munich. So now this, un unfortunately, I go back and forth a little bit. OK, so here's the plan. Um, at the risk of boring, actually, many of you, this was designed more for a condensed matter audience. I will talk about the operator spreading problem, what it is. Uh, talk about what operator spreading has to do with um, the questions of chaos and, and localization, um, which again will be review, um, certainly for some members of the audience, such as Juan Moldesena. Uh, operator spreading and OTOC, so this is sort of a review part. Then I'll describe a model calculation of operator spreading in a system uh, without conservation laws, and I'll explain why that's interesting. And then I will focus on this question of what does it mean to break time translation symmetry and use this notion of operator spreading to constrain the search for such uh, systems, which are known in the trade now as time critters. And uh, so you'll come back and, and close the circle. OK. So At some level, operator spreading is, is, is a simple question, which is you've got, in the Heisenberg picture of quantum mechanics, you can look at an operator and you can ask how it evolves as an operator. And the answer is, is of course, this, that you just take your unitary for the system and simply sandwich your operator between them, and that gives you a time-dependent operator, which is the evolution of your starting operator. Now, in an extended system, in a many-body system, or in a field theory, uh, the question that becomes interesting is, if you have a spatially local operator to begin with, you know, how does that change as you evolve it? So generically, you can imagine two things happening. One is it gets bigger, right? so in terms of its spatial location. And the second thing that can happen is that the operator gets more complex. So the Sort of standard example, you know, that's worth keeping in mind is imagine that you have some chain of some system which has various, you know, spin a half degrees of freedom or qubits, some two dimensional complex Hilbert space per site. So in this case, the local Hilbert space is that of a spin a half. The operators locally are the Pauli matrices. And then on many sites, you can take tensor products of Pauli matrices. And in fact, if you take all four possibilities for an operator per site, the three Paulis and the identity operator, then if you have a system of n qubits, there are four to the n possible Hermitian uh, operators, which can serve as a basis. And of course, the general operator is then some linear combination uh, of these four to the n possibilities. So what I mean by saying complexity is you could start on a single site with one of the Paulis, 
And as time flows, uh, it both gets bigger, but also, you know, unless something very special happens, you're not going to get a larger string of Paulis. Uh, something special can happen in things called Clifford circuits, but generally that's not what happens. And instead, you'll get an operator which in this Pauli basis, or indeed any other basis that you might decide to hang your hat on, will somehow look pretty complicated. It'll be a superposition of, of many of them. So it spreads spatially, and it sort of rotates in operator space. So that's the information that is right, contained in this operator evolution. Now, you know, we all do learn in textbooks uh, about you know, the application of the Heisenberg picture, learn basic quantum field theory. You, know, you don't learn quantum mechanics in the Schrodinger picture, and then you go to the field theory, all of a sudden they're time-dependent operators. But for the most part, they get used to do correlation functions traditionally. And so in a ground state correlation function or a correlation function in a thermal state, you're only using some restricted information about matrix elements of these operators at later times. So one of the interesting things that's happened over the last, you know, two to three years is that a lot of these developments coming actually from the string theory end and the black hole end have focused people's attention on thinking about what happens to the full operator. You know, it's sort of becoming greedier about what information you'd like to be able to extract. Okay. So these are the questions. What can one calculate? What's the evolution? And then a question uh, particularly of interest to people like myself is how does that depend on whether the system is chaotic or localized and what the conservation laws are? So localization in this case, I mean many body localization, uh, which is the generalization of Anderson localization, but it's the statement that there are Hamiltonians for which statistical mechanics fails. Um, that in, in the sense that if you look at a, uh, an exact eigenstate, for example, of such a Hamiltonian, it does not obey ETH, eigenstate thermalization, which tells you that the single eigenstate expectation values of operators are also what you would get from doing statistical mechanics, which in a sense justifies using statistical mechanics. So for many body localized Hamiltonians, that's not true, but they're interesting. And so you could ask this question and see how that depends on this issue of um, whether the system is chaotic or localized. Conservation laws are always interesting, uh, you know, and so the, their impact on this question is, is, is also interesting. Um, what I'll come back and explain is that what's also interesting is to study the system without any conservation laws, which string theorists on the whole don't like to do, um, except when they do black holes, in which case actually they do do that. Um, one just quick comment, although I sort of have decided, made up my mind on this, but it's an older slide. You know, um, classical chaos, when you learn, you know, you just take some equations of motion and you solve them, or you have some discrete maps, which are finite time equations of motion, and you iterate them. And there's this whole technology of classical chaos for how that happens. So, of course, you know, we learn early on that the Heisenberg equations of motion sort of look like the classical equations of motion up to operator ordering questions. And so, in a sense, there's a question of, you know, in a quantum chaotic system, uh, is there a sense in which I could examine the entire operator and, you know, uh, look at its temporal evolution somehow and find an analog of classical chaos? Uh, I think I know the answer to this, but it might not be right. So if any of you have thoughts on it, please, uh, please tell me. Okay. So, <clears throat> all right. So here I'm just summarizing the wisdom uh, on some existing wisdom on the topic, which developed um, a lot of it just in the last few years. Um, Alexei Kataev, I think, takes some credit for focusing uh, people's attention on it. And uh, then, of course, there was Aldersena and uh, Stanford, um, Stanford and Schenker. Um, on my own part, paper by Ho and Abanin in the condensed matter literature got me uh, thinking about some of these things. Okay, so what this wisdom says is that if you have a many-body chaotic system, so let's not be too precise over, about what that means, uh, but one which obeys statistical mechanics for the most part, this local operator will spread and its spatial uh, sort of extent will spread with this thing which was named the butterfly velocity. Uh, based on the idea that that's, that's the speed at which the disturbance spreads, as it would in a classical chaotic system. Um, and 
that at late times when it's gotten fairly big, if you began with the basis like the Pauli basis, what you should expect to see up to questions about conservation laws is something that more or less looks like a sum, you know, roughly unstructured spread over all this, all the members of the basis. So it should, it should look pretty complicated in any, any given basis. Now, for a many-body localized system, uh, we, let me give you a, a simple model of it, which is the one one often uses. And the idea is that something called a fully many-body localized system is described by uh, these degrees of freedom, sometimes called local integrals of the motion, or LIOMs, or L-bits, uh, as they are at Princeton. Um, and in the L-bit language, the story is the following. You begin with some system of spinner halves, with some interactions among them, and some random variable, some disorder. And that Hamiltonian looks complicated, but that for any given Hamiltonian, there exists a local unitary, a unitary transformation which has properties of spatial locality, so that you can rewrite it in terms of a basis of these new Paulis called L-bits. These new Paulis are spatially local or quasi-local, so they are not single site operators anymore, but are some spread over some, some distance, some localization length. But in terms of them, the Hamiltonian is made up entirely of commuting terms. So there is a leading term, which looks like a random field adding on, acting on these L-bits, a, a two uh, L-bit interaction term, then maybe multi L-bit interaction terms. And that from two onwards, there is some idea of spatial locality, which is to say that all of these you know, will decay with some localization length. Um, okay. So for such a Hamiltonian, uh, which, so, so by the way, so this is, this Hamiltonian, you know, for a given realization of disorder, you would end up with some particular set of couplings. So it's kind of a case-by-case -case transformation. There's a case-by-case -case, uh, unitary. And what this Hamiltonian does is it encodes many of the properties that we associate with the class of well-understood many-body localized systems. For instance, why don't they obey statistical mechanics? Well, you know, each one of these tau IZs is a constant of the motion. And so the system has an emergent integrability in which you began with something that didn't look integrable. There were no obvious constant to the motion, but somehow, because of this physics of disorder, uh, there exist these n constants of the motion, uh, all of which commute with the Hamiltonian. Then the fact that these constants of the motion are spatially local is important, because that's why all transport in this system ceases, in particular thermal transport ceases, and if you can't transport energy from this point in the system to some other point, then that's why statistical mechanics doesn't work because statistical mechanics will work if the subsystem, if a subsystem in a larger system sees the rest of the system as a bath, and so you have a self-consistent description, but if you can't transfer, uh, he, you know, heat, uh, energy, then, then localization uh, should, be, should be stable. So this Elbit Hamiltonian is what the sort of thing that should happen if you have a system that refuses to obey, uh, you know, statistical mechanics, and based on numerical studies and this and that and so on, uh, we have fairly compelling evidence, and as well as some uh, rigorous mathematical work by John Embry, that at least in one-dimensional many-body localized system, such a description is what you should have in mind. Okay, so for our purposes, the point is you can write this Hamiltonian down, and you can just ask, all right, under this Hamiltonian, how does a local matrix, you know, a local Pauli evolve? And the answer is, unlike the butterfly velocity, which is a linear spreading, in an MBL system, there's only logarithmic spatial spreading. Uh, and also, it's very special because it comes, you know, the only things that talk to each other at long distances are the tau z's. And so when you dress the local operator, it does get bigger, but the stuff that it tacks on are all these tau z's. So it's a very specific, restricted kind of spreading. So it's, n it's slow spreading in, s in space and a very restricted spreading in operator space. And that's because of all these extra, uh, you know, conservation laws which are there and are emergent. Okay, so since this, maybe you all heard order n talks on many body localization, and, uh, and, and, but one of the things I can do in this meeting, perhaps, to add value is to answer questions on this sort of stuff, as opposed to Juan's work, which he can answer himself. Um, any questions on this part, on the MBL part? Everybody's happy, seen it before? All right. Ah. Mm -hmm. And qubits. Yep. 
uh, then are those spreading or, or are they still somehow localized? Well, so the thing is the original qubit is a superposition of these L bits over some, some distance. And of course, you know, there are exponential tails to everything, but roughly speaking, the original qubit is a superposition of some number of tau's, then it's spread, it's spread in the same way. Correct, that's right. That's right. That's right. So initially, they've got that short time stuff, which has to do with the translation between that. Yes, correct. OK. So <clears throat> right. So what are these O talks? Well, um, so they go back to Larkin and Nuftinnikov, but they're sort of uh, I'll, I'm, again, I'm, this, this is stuff I suspect all of you are, are familiar with, but let me go over it anyway. So one, one way of defining the object is you have some, you start with two local operators and you evolve one of them. And then you take the commutator of the two, square it, and you take its expectation value in something. So it's either a ground state or a thermal state or maybe some, some completely, uh, you know, particular state that you want to look at, but you can, you can do it in any state. So the, the, the nice idea that was introduced uh, was that, um, that the growth of the OTOC will actually um, is, okay, so I'm going to say it will detect operator spreading for, for genetic spreading. But the nice idea that was introduced was that it's also a diagnostic of whether the system is uh, chaotic. Now, the thing I said at the start is how people in my neck of the woods have thought of the system being chaotic, which is to say, does it obey ETH or not? Right? Does it obey statistical mechanics? Now, this is, I think, the proper way to ask the question. Uh, for most purposes, but it's outside of numerical work, it's not such a useful way to ask the question. And that's because you ask questions like, look at the exact eigenstates, look at the distribution of energy eigenvalues, is the distribution of energy eigenvalues for a many-body system, is it Wigner-Dyson, you know, what are the statistics, do the matrix elements of particular local operators, do they agree between eigenstates when the eigenstates agree in energy density. You can do this numerically, uh, and the, the, the evidence is impressive, but clearly, it's, it's, a, you know, it's not something you can do analytically. The nice thing about a correlation function is that that's you know, the sort of thing that uh, people are, are, are good at doing. Uh, this has its challenges, but on the whole, correlation functions is what the whole technology of quantum field theory uh, was, was designed to, uh, to help with. So from my narrow perspective, one of the interesting things about uh, looking at OTOX as diagnostics of uh, you know, quantum chaos was that it transferred the problem from this way of looking at it, which is in terms of, you know, how much does it uh, resemble random matrix theory to um, a problem that could be attacked by other means. And that's, of course, what Kitaev did, for example, when he introduced the SYK model and, and carried out a calculation. It's brought with, it, brought with it other ideas, such as this idea of a chaos bound. And I'll uh, come back and, and talk briefly about that, uh, which have no obvious meaning in the random matrix language. Uh, among other things, because it's a short time phenomenon, whereas in the random matrix case, you're sort of looking at long time stuff. So anyway, all sorts of interesting ideas were introduced from your end. Um, so thank you. Okay, now you can expand that thing out, and alternatively, you can look not at the square of the commutator, but at this particular sequence of time orderings, hence out of time order. And uh, so that also has a nice interpretation that you can think of one ordering acting on the state as giving you one time-dependent state and the other one as the other time-dependent state. And then what you're looking at, roughly speaking, is the overlap of these states. And if it goes to zero, that signals the butterfly effect because this particular ordering change had uh, strong consequences and would not have this effect for an integrable system, at least for some operators. For instance, for free fermions, you can check that the usual fermionic operators do not cause this to happen. So there are these two things to look at. In one case, something grows. In the other case, it decays. But they differ by terms in the commutator squared, which I've left out. And um, both of them give you a diagnostic of, of chaos. OK. Um, so what I want to do now is present new stuff. Uh, in particular, a calculation of operator spreading in a particular system, and that will give us some insight into how these things uh, actually come about. Now, so this is work with Kurt, Tibor, uh, Frank, and there's 
had a little work by Adam Nahum uh, and Jong Wan Hai and Sagar Vijay. So I'm going to consider a system with no conservation laws. Okay. So it means the following. I have a time-dependent Hamiltonian because I don't even want energy conserved. And the time-dependent Hamiltonian has no particular symmetries. Okay? All right. So the reason this is interesting is, you know, many of the uh, new things that we want to try and understand about quantum dynamics have to do with there being quantum in an interesting sense and in a many-body sense. If you want to understand the impact of, say, conservation laws, uh, while it's interesting to try and understand how they get embedded in the quantum theory, but the basics of conservation laws, the fact that they lead to hydrodynamics uh, and diffusion and so on, all of that stuff we, we understand very well. That exists already in a classical context. It's not special to you know, the quantum theory, except for certain types of things which may involve you know, transport coefficients or something which have a certain topological character and so on. But the new thing in the quantum system, which isn't in the classical system, of course, is, the, you know, is entanglement. The, the fact that you're forced to describe the many-body system in this Hilbert space in which local degrees of freedom get entangled. So if entanglement is what you're after, uh, to isolate its effect, the best thing to do is to throw out everything else. Right? So, so no conservation laws. So anything that you see anything that's macroscopically interesting because it somehow has to be slow and large scale and so on, you know, this is a good limit to look in and then you can come back and try and put the other stuff in. So for this reason, random unitary circuits have, are quite the rage. Um, and, and that's the case where we decided to uh, look. Okay. So you can define them in various ways depending on how random you want them to be. But here is the version that we used. So you have a set of qubits, and then you come in, and at time one, you act on one and two and with a randomly picked unitary. So there's, you know, if this is a qubit, it's some four-dimensional uh, Hilbert space for these two qubits, you pick a random four by four unitary, with the Haar measure. For three and four, you do the same thing. For five and six, you do the same thing. At the next time step, you just stagger your choice, and now you hit two and three, four and five, and so on and so forth, if it's periodic boundary conditions as shown, then you come back and you again do the, you know, the, the initial sequence. But each box that I've drawn will represent in what I'm describing an individually randomly pick unitary, so they're all independent. So as you do this, if you start, for example, if you were doing states, you could start with a product state on the initial qubits, and one and two would get entangled in three or four and five and six, and then at the next step, two would get entangled with three and so on. And you can sort of see that as you go through, the degree of entanglement would grow. And in fact, in this problem, there's something like a light cone, which is to say that you, know, you can simply count how far you could have been entangled by how many, you know, uh, circuits, how, how many gates you needed to use. This is somewhat different from having a Hamiltonian, because if you have a Hamiltonian, uh, you take a commutator and then a commutator, and before you know it, there is a decay at long distances, but there's always, in a non-relativistic system, for example, an infinitesimal time evolution will give you some effect at very, very long distances. In a relativistic system, from a Kness matter viewpoint, magically, there's an exact light cone, and that has to do with the special form of the Hamiltonian. But here, we have a light cone because we're modeling unitaries and not Hamiltonians, and so we are able to simply restrict uh, what happens. Okay. So I don't want to talk today about how states evolve. That was work earlier done by Adam Nahum uh, et al., a paper I highly recommend. So I want to talk about uh, what operators do. So, yeah. So in this kind of context, there's no question of ETH or... In this context, there's no question of ETH? Or many body I can locus. ask an ETH question if I make it a flow K system. In other words, if I repeat the circuits after some number of layers, then I have a unitary whose spectrum I can talk about and its eigenstates. Then there is an ETH, and that says that every single eigenstate of that unitary gives the same answer. And for randomly picked ones like that, that will be true. But here there isn't because I, 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 nev I never repeat. So there's nothing whose eigenstates I can study. So every state will give the same answer, but obviously it won't be equilibrium answer. It's, it looks like an, kind of an infinite temperature answer, which is or like you know, in the page states. Now here, you can't ask an ETH question, but of course you can still ask if I 
what do expectation values look like at late times, right? So the physics in the system is I've got some, you know, time-dependent Hamiltonian. So of course, generally speaking, you should expect that a time-dependent Hamiltonian has all sorts of frequencies, so it heats up the system. So you should expect to find after some number of layers that if you look at correlations, they sort of look like that of a very hot infinite temperature system, and that's what they do. So it's a system which heats up, uh, and at the same time, its entanglement grows. And, and, and if that heating up that does not happen, would you say that there's also a localized system? Indeed, there is such a thing as a flow localized system, and you're stealing my thunder from my last slide. Uh, that is what the Federation figured, had to figure out in order to... Uh, so. Good. Maybe this man is a, is, is a spy from another solar system. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I'll mostly just talk about, you know, qubits and, and spin a half, but, you know, it, it's actually useful occasionally to, to, to generalize, and instead of, uh, a, a C, you know, two-dimensional complex, you can have a q-dimensional complex space, and basically sigma z gets, you put variables on a clock, uh, so you've got q variables, and sigma z gets replaced by measuring where you are on the clock, and sigma x gets replaced by moving stuff on the clock, and then the usual anti-commutation relation gets replaced by this, because, you know, you... Whether you measure the hands of a clock before or after you advance it gives you this phase factor. And then if you go q times, uh, you know, whether you just move around the clock or you just take the qth power, you get back to one. So there is, this is useful because then you can do, for example, a one over q expansion. You can work about the limit by q equals infinity. So the analogs of the on-site Pauli's are powers of these x and z operators. Uh, and and then you can have, and they, the, the, the nice feature is that the traces are worked out as they are for the Paulis, and then Pauli strings uh, are what we call products of Paulis on different sites, except that one of the Paulis is allowed to be the identity, uh, and so therefore, you know, it's, so in the case of Pauli, it could be a Z, Z, nothing, X, nothing, Z, you know, that would be a Pauli string. So that's a basis. So you can generalize all of that to a Q-dimensional local helper space. Having said that, Let's just think about spin a half. Um, okay, so what I want to do is to start with the local on-site Pauli, evolve it using this multi-layer circuit, and then expand it in the basis of standard Paulis and ask, what are these numbers? So I've taken mu, I'm taking its projection onto sigma nu, and what's this number, and what is it as a function of time? Okay, so I already said in response to what you asked that with starting low entanglement states heat up, and to infinite temperature and exhibit the corresponding entanglement. So at late times, you'll see that the entanglement, for instance, is log 2 across any, any cut. Okay, so this is like the chaotic case. So you should expect the operators to spread accordingly. Right? So the initial discussion for operator spreading was in the context of Hamiltonian systems for a butterfly velocity. But a chaotic system should behave the same way, and so you should, you should have a linear spreading of the, uh, of the support of the operator. Okay, so the nice thing about the system, of course, is that averages over circuits are tractable, because any given individual circuit is complicated because each individual uh, random uh, unitary is, is, is unique. Um, and then you have to convince yourself that the particular realizations of unitaries give you answers which are reasonably well captured by the average, which is the self-averaging question in uh, random systems. Okay. There's actually a, a nice prehistory to this work uh, in the kinetic matter community, in the quantum information community, and, and those are a, a couple of references. Okay, so, so the punchline is going to be this figure, so let me tell you the figure now, and then we can briefly discuss where it came from. So we're going to look, we're going to define a quantity uh, as, as follows. So at some stage, a local operator has spread, and what's going to happen is it's going to have a rightmost edge and it's going to have a leftmost edge. So because of this light cone aspect, the fact that if I start at the origin and I've applied my two side gates 10 times, well, I could not have gone more than 20 sides. Okay? So there's a hard cutoff in the sense that at this light cone velocity, there's been nothing outside of this at any given time and the operator will be restricted completely inside it. But the butterfly velocity is different than the light cone velocity. It'll be somewhat smaller. And what we'll find is that most of the operator is actually contained inside and around the butterfly velocity, sort of the, you know, 
it, for operators of size bigger than this region between minus VB times tau and plus VB times tau, the weight will, will decline. So by the time we get to the light cone, actually there will be hardly any operators left which are actually that big. Finally, there's something I plotted called the entanglement velocity, which you probably already know. I'll come back to that. That's not directly, it's not the first thing that you extract from the operator spreading calculation. All right, so what's this? So this says the following, supposing at some given instant of time you figured out what these weights are. So then what you do is the following, you pick, so you started you know, at the origin, right? The operator started spreading, and supposing I stand here. So there are strings, there are Pauli strings. It's not like every, in a given Pauli string, I remind you, not every site is occupied, but you know, some number of them are. And I'm asking now the following question. Which pieces of the operator stop right here? There might be some which are bigger, some which are small, right? But I want to know which pieces of the operator stop right here. So that's what this condition says. I add up the weight for all of them. Now, there's also the left-hand side, but trust me, we can, once they, beyond a point, we can more or less do this independently. So imagine, forget about, imagine that I forget about the left and I do it independently of what's going on on the left. So this is something which we call the operator density. We should call it really the right operator density. And then I can define a symmetrical object, which is the left operator density. Okay. So dealing with the full set of these coefficients uh, is not sensible or tractable. Their naive averages by themselves are zero for stupid reasons. Uh, averaging the square of this and trying to calculate it exactly is not, is not uh, that tractable. But it turns out that this quantity in which we add up how much weight there is in operators that have spread to this point and no more, pieces of the operator, that turns out to have a very simple equation which you can then solve and gain insight into how the operator spreads. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very useful thing to define. Okay. Now, once you're averaging over circuits, it actually doesn't matter whether you began with an X Pauli or Y Pauli or a Z Pauli because the answer will come out the same. So mu is, in, is irrelevant. It's new that you need to think about. Okay, so what am I doing on 20? Okay, I'll, what I'll do is I'll probably speed up a bit on this part. Um, so actually, let me say something quite simple on the, on the blackboard. That's more important. So imagine for a, so what is it? that's going on. So imagine that at this stage of the cal you know, at, at, at this instant of time, I have an operator that lives on these qubits, right? So the question is, how does it get bigger? Well, it gets bigger if at the next time step, I act with a unitary that involves this site and that site, right? Okay. So this is a Q squared dimensional space, uh, right? It's Q here and Q here. And I've got some unitary, which is a Q squared by Q, Q squared unitary. Right? Okay. So if Q gets to be very big, and I'm picking unitaries at random, what will happen is that almost all the unitaries will necessarily take the operator, which only extended till here, and give it a part that extends to the next site. Because the only way not to do it is to pick a unitary on these two qubits which is a unit, non-trivial unitary on this side, you know, right, and which is then a, a product with a non-trivial you know, unitary on the other side. And that's a very small fraction of the, of the hard measure, and it's a vanishing fraction as Q goes to infinity. So if Q is big, what you should expect to see is that if the operator has spread to this point, each piece of it acted upon with this will necessarily move one step to the right. So you see where the spreading is coming from. In this case, it's coming, as it were, from the entropics of picking unitaries. So it's unitary evolution, but you see this sort of one-sidedness which is setting in, which is causing the operator to spread. Now, if Q isn't infinite and is finite, um, th there's a version of this which, which you can derive. What's going on in here is that, you know, I have this two-layer circuit, so I sort of have to coarse grain a little bit over sites and then over two layers. So I have to coarse grain time by two steps and space by two steps. And when you do it, uh, you, you get something which I've written down here. You can look at this line, which is at one step with some probability. With basically, what this looks like is a bias diffusion problem, which is you start at x and at, and at t, and at x and t plus 1, you can, you can be at x plus 1, you can be at x minus 1, and with some probability, you stay where you are. So maybe you move a bit to the left, a bit to the right, and, and you where you are. But because of this entropic effect that I described, 
In fact, the probability to move right is bigger than the probability to move left. It's a biased random walk. Uh, there's also a biased random walk taking place on the other side. And as a result of the biased random walk, the, this operator density to R has the form at late times of a Gaussian wave packet, which is moving with this linear velocity, which is the difference of the two probabilities of going right and left, which is, then gives me my butterfly velocity, the formula for which comes out to be q squared minus 1 over q squared plus 1, which is strictly less than 1, which is the light cone velocity in these units. Then there is a diffusion constant which governs this diffusive behavior, the fact that this Gaussian wave packet is also going to spread like the square root of time, and that diffusion constant depends on q like so. So if you're asking where are the right ends of the pieces of the operator, the answer is the right ends are spreading with this butterfly velocity, but between themselves there is a spread, and the spread also grows with time at late times you know, it's, so the mean position is vb times t, but then there's plus or minus, you know, d, uh, square root of d times t. So that's the answer that you get out by this very simple business of taking random unitaries and just deriving this equation for this quantity. So the trick was to, was to find this rho r that we could, we could study. Okay. Uh, I do want to emphasize, that's where the right ends are, right? It's not that the it's not like a local operator has spread into an operator that's sitting where that wave packet is. That's where the right ends are. The operator actually is, is big. It's got a left end and a right end. Okay, so what can relate uh, the OTOC to, to, to operator spreading? Uh, so again, there's some details maybe I should, I should just skip. Uh, just look at the bottom, and then I'll make a comment about Lyapunov exponents. So, so basically, right, so, so the idea is you have one operator which is spreading because you examine it at time t, and the second one, and you're calculating the talk between them. So basically, as long as the spread of this one, you know, so let's say, you know, this is, this is one of them, and, and I start one off here. So it spreads and spreads, and they continue to commute. But when the spread hits the second operator is when I should expect the talk to change, right? So things will happen... If, you're, if the second operator is a distance s away, things will happen at a time, which is that distance divided by the butterfly velocity, and that's what's going on. Some pieces of the operator arrive earlier, some arrive later, and so therefore, instead of simply going zero and then jumping to one, you see a more gradual buildup. Now, I said there's this diffusive aspect of the problem, so that the size of that packet was growing like the square root of time. So what that means is that the time over which this increase takes place in the value of the OTOC itself increases if you are looking at the OTOC between more distant operators. Uh, so therefore, S1 is less than S2, and at the longer distance, the buildup is more gradual. Now, this definition of a quantum Lyapunov exponent that was, uh, came out of some uh, holographic calculations uh, was dependent on the idea that if you examined an OTOC, it's growth at short times uh, is, in a suitable sense, uh, you know, exponential uh, or very rapid. What I'm telling you here is that in a system with locally bounded Hilbert spaces, such as this one, actually the farther you go, the more, the more gradual the increase becomes. It grows like the square root, right? So that's inconsistent with having something which would look exponential and, and sharp. So this, I think, is now probably generally considered to be the correct answer for systems of this kind, where you have locally bounded Hilbert spaces, uh, unlike the original calculation, which was in a system with a large n parameter, which allows the local Hilbert space to be, uh, to be large. OK. All right. Now, uh, there are, you know, in a given realization, there are fluctuations, but the basic front propagation picture uh, is correct. We've also done some numerics on a flow case system, which is not a system with with, with, in which the circuit repeats uh, after a certain time. And uh, that also has no symmetries, except it has this... It, it doesn't have a symmetry that gives you a conservation law. It does have a periodicity in time. And, uh, and, and this basic picture uh, is correct there also. Okay. Let me skip this uh, about the connection between operator growth and entanglement growth. Needless to say, you can make a connection and you can relate the growth of operators to um, how the entanglement, bipartite entanglement changes between 
region and its complement. Uh, the reason I wanted to cover it was that it was the growth of the entanglement that allows you to define uh, a um, entanglement velocity. And for this particular system, you can do that, you can get an answer, and it comes out to be strictly less than the butterfly velocity. And that, again, relates to this uh, front spreading business. All right. So let me, since I'm down to 13 minutes, let me try and deliver on the, on the initial advertising. Time translation symmetry break. OK, so this is a paper with uh, Vedika and Kurt. So. Um, some years back, uh, Frank Wilczek suggested that there could be things called time crystals. Um, and, um, but the question of what one might mean by time translation symmetry breaking outside of an intuitive uh, sense was not addressed uh, until, until we did. So we just took an extremely uh, stupid viewpoint, uh, which is the following, which is that you know, a symmetry in a quantum system is represented by some unitary operation. And the way you detect symmetry breaking is you have an order parameter for the symmetry and look in a state and you ask, does the order parameter have an expectation value? So time translations are also implemented by unitaries. They are the unitaries of you know, time, uh, time evolution. So we decided to just follow the, the, the cookbook and ask, can we define order parameters for time translation symmetry breaking? OK, so to remind you for an internal symmetry, the story is you know, you've got typically a, a unitary that acts in the system whose action factors on, on, on sites. So if you're a spin flip, you've got to go in and flip every spin or rotate every spin by a certain amount. So that's this bit. Uh, I'm going to only be going to be talking about abelian symmetries because time translation is one, and that's all I need. And then if a Hamiltonian is symmetric, it means that it commutes with this, these symmetry operators. And if it's, a, if it's a unitary system, so let's say in particular a flow case system, so for a flow case system, I have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, but the Hamiltonian is periodic. It repeats after a certain period. So then it turns out that instead of studying the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, I can study eigenstates of the unitary for a single period. And if I know those, much as I know the eigenstates of a Hamiltonian, right, I can get all of the time evolution in principle as uh, uh, formulaically. If you know the eigenstates and eigenvalues of the unitary, you can get the time evolution formulaically. OK. So in the unitary case, again, I require this operator to commute. So these are the two cases that we will consider in parallel. So what's an order parameter? Well, it's some operator which um, transforms non-trivially under the action of the symmetries. It's abelian. It have to, has to pick up some phase, which depends on the group element, as well as on the irrep that the operator happens to fall in. So all right. Now, um, here I've written it as g is broken to h, but let's forget h and just say, you know, let's ask if g is broken. I look at the, OK, now, I want to take the view that I'm going to look in eigenstates. So if I have, and in particular, I'll take the view that I want to think of eigenstates for a finite system and then take the limit of the infinite system. So for a finite system with a symmetric Hamiltonian or unitary, what will happen is the following, that I will study the two-point function uh, of the disorder parameter that I've just defined and find that if I take the infinite volume limit first and then take these two points off to infinity, the expectation value will be non-zero, while if I look at a single point function, the expectation value will be zero by symmetry at any finite L, and therefore the limit will be zero. So this is the classic statement that the two-point function detects symmetry breaking when the one-point system will not. Uh, if, if there's a remaining subgroup, then you want the statement that the order parameter, you know, depending on whether it transforms under the subgroup or not, uh, it, it follows this or it doesn't. OK. So, so let's come back to time translations, which I think I have these slides mixed. So let's do that. OK. OK, so I want to mimic this procedure for time translations. So for Hamiltonian systems, time translations are implemented by this family of unitaries, right? OK, and the uh, TTS right, group is, is the real numbers. For a flow K system, it's implemented by the single period unitary. And time translation symmetry is now the integers, because you have to translate by a period in order to get a symmetry. Clearly, the Hamiltonian commutes with this U of t. And equally clearly, this unitary commutes with that unitary, since they're exactly the same. Right? OK, so I want to make one bureaucratic point. Time translation symmetry is what in the 50s would have been called a dynamical symmetry, which is to say it depends on which system I'm looking at. Right? 
the unitary that implements time transition symmetry depends on the Hamiltonian or depends on the unitary. It's not like rotations, where you've got a whole class of Hamiltonians for which you have the same rotation operator, right? It really is, it's like the SO4 symmetry of the hydrogen atom. I mean, it, it's really specific to the hydrogen atom. Okay. This is important because you're tempted to think everything flows in time and you make some time crystal as if, you know, but no, it's really a Hamiltonian, it's a dynamical symmetry. Okay. All right, uh, sorry. Okay, so here's the question. Does a local order parameter exist? Why do I want a local order parameter? Because the usual broken symmetry logic is the two-point function at very long distances, right? The one-point function was zero expectation value, and the two-point function is non-zero because the reason I'm getting zero is I've got one, you know, one symmetry broken state and then another and many of them with different right, directions of symmetry breaking. And so the two-point function just captures the fact that if you were pointing up here, then you're also pointing up there. Okay. So, so we want a local order parameter because we want to be able to correlate distant regions. So we've forgotten the fact that this is time. It's some unitary. And the question is, what happens? So we want this. We want an operator which, under time translations, picks up a phase, a non-zero phase. And the operator is local. Very good. So this should make you happy because this starts to look like the operator spreading question. Okay, now if I can find such an object, then in an eigenstate, I should expect to find the following, that it's one point function, right, uh, is up to a phase itself, which means that this must be zero. On the other hand, now we can ask, what about at long distances where this argument no longer holds? Is there an expectation value? And if this is non-zero, then we will declare that the system breaks time translation symmetry. So far so good? Seems, seems nice. Okay. Now this locality is important because of course non-local order parameters always exist. Given exact eigenstates of the system, I can just make up, it's the adjoint action of time evolution, I can make up this, you know, projector-like object and it picks up a phase. But local order parameters are rare and would require some very special dynamics uh, to, to make that happen. Among other things, we just finished saying that for any many-body chaotic system, or even a Hamiltonian many-body localized system, we argued at the start, that any local operator spreads. So if it spreads, it doesn't get back to itself under a phase. Right? So those systems, by this definition, can't exhibit time translation symmetry breaking. Likewise for chaotic flow case systems, because the same thing will happen there. So that leaves one category of systems in my little table of options. Um, which I didn't draw, but had in my head, which is flow KMBL systems, which uh, Logan and I can brought up at the start. Good time for him to wake up and listen to the answer. Um, which is, and there we will find, by example, something which was first called the pie spin glass, and then in, in a brilliant feat of marketing, not by me, unfortunately, I'm hopeless at marketing, we renamed the time crystal. Um, okay, so, so I've argued to you that operator spreading implies that you shouldn't expect to find this for chaotic systems. Now I want to show you by example that you can find it for a particular kind of flow case system which is localized and, uh, and that's, that's our remaining option. Okay, so how does that work? So this was worked by Vedika, I, never mind. No. Okay, so let me describe it in the simplest setting of a one-dimensional system. Um, Okay, so, so, so what's going on? I'm describing a unitary which will act over a single period. The unitary is defined for a spin chain. So imagine, you know, this, you, you've got some sp spin a half chain in one dimension. And I'm going to tell you what it does over one period. So I've written it on the left, but this is the simplest factor to understand. One of the factors of the unitary is I've got a system of spins, think in the Z basis, what this does is just, just comes and flips all the spins. Okay? So it's a product of sigma x's, and in this z basis, it just sends every spin to, to minus itself. Now, this is more complicated. After this is done, if I put it on the right, but let's forget that, uh, I'm going to have a Hamiltonian, which is made up of a Ising exchange interaction between neighboring spins, sigma z, sigma z, and a field acting on each individual spin, which has a, an x component, a y component, and a z component. And all these numbers in general will be random. Okay? 
So these are random numbers. They vary from site to site and bond to bond. And then, so, so that's my unit ring, right? So I've, for a single period, this is what I will do. There's some amount of time for which I have evolved the system, but I've buried the time in the definitions of the J's and H's. If I, I could call them something else, and I could multiply by the time period, and that would give me uh, that number. Good, so, so capital T is implicit. Now, to understand why this is uh, what, it, what I claim it is, let's start with something very simple. Let's set all these fields equal to zero, and that gets us down to this much simpler unitary. So, in fact, one way to think about this is this product of sigma x is, if you had a field in the x direction uh, and you put it on for time pi over 2, then the unitary for that is exactly, because if you, the field points in the x direction, a z rotates about it, and we pick the time so that z goes to minus z. So what this looks like is a system in which, if you're familiar with the transverse fieldizing model, for part of the period, specially chosen, I apply the transverse field. For part of the period, I apply the exchange coupling. And then I just toggle between them. So it's the simplest binary Floquet drive. I do one and the other, one and the other, one and the other. Okay? All right. So in this particular case, I actually have a Floquet unitary, which is Ising symmetric. So Px is this Ising symmetry operator. It sends z to minus z, so it leaves this term invariant and obviously commutes with itself. I'll lift this in a bit, but right now it's, it's useful. Now, under this unitary, it's easy enough to ask what happens to the, a local sigma z. Well, the sigma z commutes with this piece and is flipped by that piece. So if I begin with these two factors here and those two factors there, I can take the zz part through and then the p part through, and I'll, I'll just find an overall minus sign. So look, something very interesting happened. I produced for you a local order parameter under time evolution for this unitary a local operator which returns to itself with a minus sign, right? Okay. Now, I said this required localization. In what sense is this system localized? Well, uh, if, you know, forget about P for a minute. Sigma Z, Sigma Z is just essentially a classicalizing model, right? If I give you a spin configuration in the Z basis, uh, you know, so imagine I take everybody to this point up and everybody after that point down. That's a domain wall. That's the sort of thing you think of as an excitation of an Ising system. It goes nowhere under this piece of the time evolution. It just sits there. Likewise, this one comes along and it makes all the ups down and the downs up, but the domain wall goes nowhere. So it's actually a system with completely localized dynamics. Okay. okay. So, so, so a, 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 a floquet localized system has been now shown to, to give you a local order parameter. If I go two periods, then of course I have two minus signs and you come back to itself. So what that's telling me is that I've broken time, I'm going to break time translation symmetry down, for, you know, it, it's an integer symmetry to begin with, and I'll break it down from z to 2z, so I'll double the period from the initial one to a doubled period. So, so, so there, there that is. Now, uh, one of the things about this system if I have a unitary with an exact Ising symmetry, as I did until now, of course, this thing, the sigma z, is also an order parameter for the global Ising symmetry. Okay? So I'll, I'll, I'll take that connection away in a minute. But right now, that's the case. It's doing double duty for two different symmetries. What are the eigenstates? Well, I claim the eigenstates are the Schrodinger cat states. And the reason is that if I feed the unitary a particular z configuration, the part of the unitary that was e to the i, j, z, z simply picks, reads a phase from them, which is this phase. So it just, you know, just the classical energy of this particular configuration of spins with the, using these couplings, and that's a phase. And then the spin flip operator comes along and simply flips the z's into the z bars, which are just the conjugate Ising uh, values. Likewise, if I feed the unitary the Ising reverse state, I get back the first one and uh, pick up the same phase. Um, um, okay. So if I take these particular linear combinations, uh, I find that the unitary acting on these plus minus cat states gives me plus minus one times the fixed phase times, times the states back. So what I learned from this is that something quite special is happening. The quasi energies, so called, which are the logarithms of the eigenvalues of the unitary uh, differ by pi. Okay, so it's actually something simpler I should say, which is if you think of the eigenvalues of the unitary as living on a circle, 
Right. What we're saying is if there's one here, there's one diametrically opposed on the other side. If there's one here, there's one diametrically opposed on the other side. Okay. So the spectrum of this unitary is very special. It comes with these exact pi pairs where they sit across the diameter of the circle and in terms of this quasi-energy they differ by pi. Okay. What about the eigenstates? Well, the eigenstates have long-range Ising order, right? I mean, if you calculate the sigma z, sigma z correlation function, that's long-range in this state and it's long-range in that part. So this is, I mean, these are states with long-range order, Ising long-range order. The only feature is that depending on exactly what this configuration is, you know, it could be all up, it could be some number of downs, the particular pattern depends on the state. So the reason we call this the pi spin glass, one was because it had pi doublets, and the spin glass term was to note that each eigenstate had a particular pattern of Ising symmetry breaking, which just varied from state to state, which is reminiscent of the idea of a spin glass, although the traditional spin glass is actually an equilibrium phase and uh, even obeys ETH. But nevertheless, it's a useful uh, piece of terminology. Um, so this is, by the way, if I didn't have this Ising spin flip, uh, which I had in the unitary, and I only had the Hamiltonian part, then I get also a spin glass phase, but without the pi degeneracy. Instead, I get two eigenstates with exactly the same energy, which is the usual statement for Ising symmetry breaking is that you have pairs. So what's interesting is that the usual spin glass in this localized setting has doublets with zero splitting, and this new phase has doublets with pi splitting. All right. So we have this new phase, uh, which we call the pi spin glass. And because sigma z is also an uh, a order parameter for time translation sy symmetry, each eigenstate of this system, of this unitary, breaks time translation symmetry. Okay? So by example, I've constructed for you a unitary uh, whose um, eigenstates break time translation symmetry. Um, okay, so one intuitive way to think about it, of course, is to say, supposing instead of talking about an eigenstate, I started with an initial state, which was one of these. Then what would happen is, after one period, this would become that, after two periods, it would come back to this, and so on and so forth. So you see where the period doubling is coming from, whatever your initial state is in this basis, it, you know, it flips, flips back, flips, flips back, and so the dynamics is double the period. Now, it's actually better than that, which is to say that I can in fact start with any initial state, it doesn't even have to be a special state of this kind, and as long as it has some expectation values for the Z operator, so it's, the state itself is Ising symmetry breaking, if I feed it and I evolve it in time, what happens at long times is that the local expectation value of the Ising variables, it's not one as it would be in this state, it's something less, but it settles down and then it oscillates precisely with this double period. Okay? So in other words, I'm drawing something very special, but in fact it's, yeah. The breaking had to do with uh, some, with the eigenstates. Correct. But here, if you took the linear superposition of the C and the C bar, I mean with the plus or, let's say with the plus sign. Yeah. Uh, you, you you would not have the symmetry breaking. Is that, that correct? If I picked only one of these, you say? No, if you pick only one, yes, but you're supposed to take the linear combination no, so plus it, minus. No, no, in these states, the two-point function is non-zero, while the one-point function is zero. So by my definition, these states plus and minus, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But what, what selects those eigenstates versus the one that has just the Cs? Has what? Uh, these are the eigenstates of the unitary. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're right? flipping. Yeah, so, so what I was moving on to now was to say, uh, and I confused the issue a little bit. In terms of eigenstates, I've delivered everything I said. Now you could ask the question, in an experimental setting, which is important, who can prepare an eigenstate? Right? So is this something which is just a, something that you know about eigenstate, or is it experimentally relevant? And so what I was, so I want to say two things. So let me say one thing, first go back, and then I'll come back, and on the blackboard I'll sketch the, the, the other bit. The first thing I want to say is, remember at the start I said, you know, really, I can add this, and in fact, I can add other terms. So the statement is actually that I can add, you know, the extra terms should not be too large, but I can basically add all sorts of 
extra terms. In particular, if I add these fields, the Ising symmetry that I had when I didn't have them is gone. Now what happens is, I can't immediately tell you what this operator is, which does this, but as long as the system remains many-body localized, which it will for sufficiently small values of these random fields, there exists a quasi-local operator, which depends upon the particular couplings, which has this property. Now, th this is why I emphasized at the start that time translation symmetry breaking was a dynamical symmetry. It was a realization-dependent symmetry, dependent on the particular couplings in the system. Since the symmetry generator, the, the symmetry operator depends on the couplings, you can't really complain if the order parameter depends on the coupling. Right. So, for time translation symmetry, it happens to be the case that giving you an operator which depends, which is sort of case by case, is okay because the symmetry itself is case by case. But if the many, if many body localization continues to hold, which it will for sufficiently small ones, this is true. So this is very important because it says, if you get sufficiently close to this unitary, you don't have to be exactly there. Right? And you will have this phenomenon of time translation symmetry breaking. So it's a very robust phenomenon. It's not you know, it, it doesn't require any particular symmetries to be present in the Hamiltonian. It's an emergent symmetry, so it holds kind of in all directions in, 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 in theory space. So the last thing I want to say is this business of how do I detect this in an experiment and how was it detected in an experiment. So there, what I was saying was that if you, the sort of thing you want to do is to prepare some general initial state, evolve it, and see what it does. So as an example in this, in this special case, if I prepared one of these states, then what you would see is up, down, up, down this pattern, and then you could measure this pattern, and that's essentially what's done in experiments. But it's, it's better than that, and that requires a bit more work than I'm going to do right now, which is really, once you've got these random fields and sort of more generic coupling sitting in there, you know, you don't have such a simple description, but in terms of the L bits for this localized system, and there is a set of L bits for the Floquet localized system, uh, in terms of the L bits, the story would look the same. Okay? But in terms of the physical bits, which have some expansion in terms of the L bits, the story is a bit more confused. But when you go to long times, it turns out stuff purifies very nicely. And then if you measure just some local P bit, you know, or, or physical bit expectation value, it just measure the spins, it turns out that you see this pure pi pattern at long times, where whatever pattern you see in one time step flips, flips back again, and so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, this is a very nice phase for two reasons. One, you don't have to completely fine tune that. You don't have to fine tune the Hamiltonian. You don't have to be in a particular symmetry determined manifold. You have to be close to this point. Second, to detect it, you don't need to prepare an eigenstate or some very special state. You just have to prepare a broad class of states where there's some, you know, and in fact, once you have generic directions of symmetry breaking in this language, it turns out almost anything you prepare turns out to work. You start it, start it off, measure it long times, and you can see what's going on. When you leave the phase, when the couplings change, so for instance, if, this, if, if, uh, if the system becomes chaotic, then this late time signature will go from showing this oscillating pattern of some local order parameter to one in which the expectation value of the local order parameter has gone to zero. So you can experimentally, despite the fact that statistical mechanics doesn't hold, detect what happens by starting with fairly generic initial states, looking at long times, and then seeing how that behavior changes in a singular way. Okay, that was more or less what I wanted to say. Uh, I should probably note that, you know, this is the simplest. So this is sort of the first new Floquet phase in the sense that you can give a sharp definition of a phase, which is in terms of eigenstates of this unitary. You can give it for a Floquet system, which is periodically driven, lacks a Hamiltonian. You can give it for a system for which statistical mechanics doesn't hold, which for Floquet is just as well, because statistical mechanics holding means infinite temperature, and there's nothing to discuss. Uh, and then there are other phases which have been constructed, and it has no analog in equilibrium. So Kurt and I constructed a family of 1D phases of different types. Uh, there was work then from Station Q, um, from Berkeley, which has since split into Harvard and Texas, uh, UCLA. There's a progress article that Roderick Mosler and I wrote that uh, some of the students in the hall may enjoy looking at uh, if what I said was obscure. With that, I thank you for your patience and uh, stop. Could you say a little more about the experiments? Which systems did they realize and what would they actually do? Fair enough. Okay. So, experimental story is actually a little less clear than 
um, than the New York Times might lead you to believe. Um, so there were two experimental systems. One of them is ion traps. This is 10 spins, or some number of that order. It's a fantastic experiment, because if you get into the details of how you know, they have these 10 spins and they realize this drive and so on, I mean, it's a real experimental tour. The first, but it's 10 spins. 10 spins, you know, we can all do in our computers. Um, so you can't, I mean, they, they, can't, they realize something pretty close to the drive. And you know, then they have some non-trivial tests, but it's, it's, it's analog simulation. Now, there are two other experimental systems. So one, what Misha looked in in that lab that you saw at the start, He's, got, he's been studying these nitrogen vacancy centers for a, for a long time. Right? So these are lo centrally local spin half systems embedded in, um, in, 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 a, in a solid matrix. So he's got a lot of them. And he's got a lot of them which are arranged three-dimensionally. And not only are they arranged three-dimensionally, they have this dipolar interaction which is fairly long range. Now, one of the issues about many-body localization is you sort of come to the conclusion that as a strict matter, it probably only exists in 1D in a random system as opposed to a quasi-periodic system. So one in 3D, uh, that's an issue. Second, with longer range interactions, it gets worse, which is the longer the interaction range, the more uh, likely it is that you... Know, you um... Now, of course, in an experiment, you don't have to be localized forever. You only have to be localized. So the best understand... So what he saw was he, again you know, prepares the state, then he does this, uh, it's, an, it's very easy there, it's kind of an NMR type protocol, and then he can measure this, this magnetization, and he found, you know, very nice pi oscillations for 100 cycles or something. The best current understanding is that it's some sort of critical three-dimensional time crystal state, uh, but there isn't a phase in the same sense in which it exists in 1D. So in 1D, we have a small system, uh, and not a big one. We have a big system in 3D, but 3D is, is kind of a, a, a marginal dimension. What is in the works in Emmanuel Bloch's group is work on Rydberg systems where one should be able to make 100 spins and in, in 1D. And so when that's really nailed down, I think we will have tested the ideas beyond you know, what we can do with the, uh, do with the computer. That's, that's the honest answer. <laughs> Could you say a little bit more about the entanglement velocity and the sort of structure of the ah. entanglement? Okay. So, you know, all I wanted to say there was that um, you can, um, right, to, boost, to, to use the calculation of operator spreading to look at the entanglement, uh, right, what we do is we, right, we start with the product state and we have this product density matrix, but then, you know, it's, a, it's an operator, so we expect. I'm sure I'm telling you stuff you've uh, known for longer than I have, but anyway, you can, again, write it in terms of, you know, the, the, the Pauli basis. And in principle, then, if I know how each one of them spreads, uh, I know how it spreads. And of course, these guys are not all local Paulis. They're also now Pauli strings. So what you then do is you can think a little bit about it and convince yourself that if you're looking at some region B inside a, a larger one, that you, you want to, uh, sorry, region A, that you can drop um, those Pauli strings which live only in B. So you sort of add this counting of things spread, and then at some stage they leave the region, and, and then you can do a counting on that basis. So on that basis, you can use your operator spreading uh, uh, result to draw a picture, I mean, to, to get an answer for um, what the entanglement is between a, uh, you know, a, a bipartite entanglement. And then here I was just saying the, the usual thing that, you know, the you get the velocity by taking the asymptotic one, which in this case would be log q per site, and then basically, you know, you have some straight line that you draw which intersects it, and the slope of that is what you define as the entanglement velocity. And so in this case, using the operator spreading calculation, we can then give the slope, and that slope comes out to be this. And so, uh, in the literature that you're more familiar with than I am. I, I, I forget what the reasons were for... But the entanglement velocity strikes me as a construct. Uh, so I, I, maybe somebody else can tell me whether one should be impressed that the answer comes out to be less than VB or not, but, but, but it does. Okay, uh, so 
You said that, you know, for a generic state in this uh, flocket localization, you, ha you have to wait some time before you see these spy beats. But so what does that time depend on? What what are characteristic of the right. state? So the, the, the main thing that, you know, it's a random system. So naively, there are all sorts of frequencies. Because the local environment, if you're looking at a local spin, it sees its friends, there are all sorts of... So at short times, it's actually a very complicated time evolution. What happens in this uh, many-body localized system is because of these longer-range cu couplings, basically it's a dephasing, let me put it sort of stupidly, but it's, it's more or less right, that you have these eigenstates of the unitary. Right. Okay, so you started with some initial state, which was some random coefficients, uh, and then at late times, right, in here, you've got e to the i epsilon alpha, and if I've done it n times, it's that times, or let's say capital uh, no, n times, I've, I've repeated that many times. And then in the usual way, if I take then this, so that's psi of t, if I take some operator expectation value at, at this time, that's some alpha, some beta, and then it's C alpha bar, C beta, and then e to the i epsilon alpha minus epsilon beta times n times alpha O beta. All right. So the main thing is that in the more fancy many-body localized system, as opposed to an Anderson localized system where these energies are very special because they derive from single particle energies being added, in a many-body localized system, these energy differences are spread over some range, except for the fact that every time these two sit here, either when alpha and beta are the same, then you get zero, or when they're right opposite each other, in which case you get e to the i pi n, which is minus 1 to the n. So what you need is enough time so that whenever epsilon minus epsilon beta is not 0 or pi, you need to have enough n so that those phases spread over the circle. Then all the other terms average away, and you're left with two pieces. Is that a time-independent piece? And then there is this piece that oscillates it back. The correction is a power law. So it's not a time scale as such, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a power law decay to this asymptotic regime. And the, the nice thing is that in the many-body localized system, the interactions among the L bits generate enough dispersion in these eigenvalues for that purification to take place. If it was an Anderson localized system, it doesn't happen. And in fact, even at very long times, there's some very complicated, you know, almost periodic function with all sorts of frequencies that just goes on forever. So. Uh, the power depends on, uh, it's not universal, it depends on the interactions and the Albert Hamiltonian and so on and so forth. But it, I think there's some bounds on it, if I remember right, but it's, yeah. This is what's called dephasing in the MBL literature. Okay. Dephasing, yeah. as you know, has all sorts of meanings depending on the literature. <laughs> this one. Okay, if there are no further questions, let's thank Shivaji again. Thank you.